Technology kind of surprises us. It seems a little bit like magic. Every day, you know, I, I send out to, a message to my social network, something along the lines of, have you seen this yet? I also tend to talk to a lot of people across a lot of diverse industries, and they all say the same thing to me these days. It's all changing so fast. And so I ask them, is it speeding up? No pause, definitely. And so I ask them, is it good? They pause. They look down, they look up, they look back in my eyes and they say, yeah, I think so. And then they brighten a little bit and they say, and it's all so exciting, right? So I care about that pause. I call it the space between the lightning and the thunder. The other thing I ask them is how far ahead can you see? And these are pretty serious and empowered people and they say, hey man, my 25 year strategic plan is now 10, my 10 year plan is now three to five, or they're just winging it. But the other thing they also say to me is they believe that their children's lives and their children's children's life is going to be completely amazing. So why the curve? Why is the pace accelerating? And in many cases, it's accelerating almost exponentially, which means not everything can change at that same pace. And so we have these kind of social frictions. It's the difference between the technical capability to do something and the readiness to deploy something, and that causes friction. So here's a huge arc, right? This is 11,000 years of human history driven by innovation, coincident with and uh, empowering to uh, population expansion, everything from agricultural and to writing, to industrialization, to, tech, to computers, to the, the internet. And at this scale, it goes straight up from here. So the implication for you is that your life, your world, is unprecedented. It's unique in all of history. Here's another view. This of the rate of mass adoption, in this case, communication technology, and we see the arc going up from the telephone to the radio, television, and mobile web, arcing up. Moral of the story here is technology is proliferating faster, ideas spread more quickly, and more population is impacted sooner. Another arc, this of the acceleration of compute power from Ray Kurzweil's work, The Law of Accelerating Returns, where he believes that these Fundamental paradigm shifts are happening more and more often, that the technological changes are increasingly profound and they rent the fabric of human history, thus the thunder. So why? why fundamental question, why does the pace of, of innovation accelerate? Well, there's a handful of reasons why. One is sheer population. We've got more people solving more problems with the ability to capture, hey there, with the ability to capture and share more information more quickly, right? So more ideas spreading more quickly. Number two is access. Never before, it's, it's getting better, it's not, not great, but we see a dramatic lowering in the cost of access to the tools of innovation. What used to be the purview of the big university, the big lab, the big research project, the big, um, the big budget, now we see breakthrough tools for innovation like machine learning and bioengineering and on-demand 3D printing and cheap connectivity and online knowledge access to everything affordable at the level of the dorm, right? Number three is value. Uh, innovation went from being a nice to have to being an essential to being ultimately critical. So you take the current the, the recent climate change summit in Paris. We have the Breakthrough Energy Coalition where the private sector stepped forward and say we're gonna advance and accelerate innovation to help save us all, right? So innovation, move, innovation is being nurtured now, it's being incubated, it's being encouraged, and it's now seen as a fundamental competitive advantage. So for each dot on that acceleration curve, if you zoom in, you'll see an adoption curve, right? An adoption curve typically reads left to right from the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and the lagging paranoid. 
right? And on the leading edge of every adoption curve, you typically see a Gartner hype cycle, right? Which goes from the trigger to the peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, plateau of productivity. Moral of the story is, is that each one of these phases has its own unique hurdles. Many things never cross the chasm. It's messy. It's a fuzzy slinky of expansion and collapse and, and false plateaus and false starts. And you really actually you don't see it. There's a lot of little lines heading down that end in failure. So we have unanticipated consequences. Unanticipated things happen. Uh, the good intentions may do as much harm as malevolence if they lack understanding, a la Camus. Right? So let's talk a little bit about how this shakes out. So typically what happens is a new technology is invented. It gets popularized. Adoption starts to spread. New languages surface. New roles are created. New value systems are created. Subcultures grab onto it. There's role friction at the boundaries. The ripples spread out. You have unintended and, un, uh, and unanticipated use cases. Things happen. Problems occur, and these negative use cases get sensationalized and become the primary thought drivers in the heads of the people who are making decisions. So the chasm opens its maw, and the social controls and safeguards are either non-existent, invented after the fact, or by the time they're released, they're out of date. However, in the midst of some really big disruptions, I found some very simple processes being innovated by um, savvy teams that can help mitigate these problems. So let's take transportation. It's a double digit percentage of the GDP. It's in a massive flux. For example, just the internet things alone's expected impact to the, to the uh, field of transportation is $800 billion per year by 2020. And I recently attended a summit um, by a State Department of Transportation coupled with the innovation thought leaders for autonomous vehicles. And it was really wonderful to see these guys trying to mesh together their objectives and reduce the friction. And they're working on really serious stuff. It's get everybody from here to there faster, reduce congestion, save lives, and uh, reduce uh, um, pollution, right? So real serious work. And the kind of stuff that's coming is amazing. We're talking about you know, all different kinds of alternative vehicle cars. We're talking about cloud-connected cars, dr uh, driver-assisted cars, driverless cars. Um, we're talking vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication mesh meshes between the cars. Think of it as an extended network of perception that moves down the road together, right? You've got to rethink ownership. They're, they're talking about mobility as a paid dollar per mile service. We're talking about on-demand public transportation. This is the conversation they're having. So what gets disrupted in that construct? The car manufacturers and the car dealerships get disrupted. They become purveyors of large managed local fleets. Auto insurance gets disrupted. Um, auto servicing gets disrupted. And guess what? When you're no longer hands on the car, what do you do? You get distracted. You turn around, you fiddle with stuff behind you. You fall asleep. And so the cars not only have to manage what's going on around them, they have to manage your perceptions. They've got to bring you back. And guess what? The next generation never learns to drive. The next generation never pumps gas. And how far out there is this, right? What's on the horizon? Well, it's here now. It's not way out there. You've got Tesla with hands-free highway driving right now. You've got alternatives to ownership. You've got Uber. You've got Zipcar, right? You've got Lyft. You've got cars that park themselves. You've got anti-collision systems. You've got um, automated uh, adaptive cruise control. That's here now and here today. <clears throat> So what are the practices these organizations are using to help bring these technologies forward, mitigate the disruptions, as well as bring society along with? And it's pretty simple. It's a, a set of process innovations I'm going to share with you. Number one, 
<laughs> Number one thing. Number one is do pilots, right? They do sub-city regional pilots that are highlighted by the mayors to attract acclaim and attention to their city as a good future city. Number two, you do the easy things first, right? You don't go after the big complicated problems. You do the, the problems that are, that are solvable. We're talking about um, uh, fixed route people movers or, or truck caravanning, right? Or alternative, fleet, alternative fuel fleets before you get to bumper to bumper hands free, before you get to highway hands free. Number three, multidisciplinary teams. Broadly multidisciplinary teams where you have both the vehicle engineers working with the infrastructure builders, working with the security people, working with the legislator people, as well as the, the standards bodies people. And most importantly, the end consumer as co-creator of these solutions embedded in the team. Number four, you do a lot of rapid cycles. Since we know that long-term planning fails, what you do is you co-create the assumptions and objectives together. You deploy minimum viable pilots at a small scale within a region. You collect data for a finite time window. And based on that data, you analyze the data and you use it to drive and educate and inform the next cycle out. So you sneak up on success, right? And you share the successes with the next cycle out. Number six, um, number five is social co-creation. Because we know that at the city level that they can produce enabling legislation and regulatory framework faster than at the state or the federal level, you let the grassroots pilots organize and bring up the, leg, the, the regulatory frameworks within the pilot itself. And number six, you promote it. If it works, you talk about the positive use cases and you share that with the next bigger uh, pilot up the cycle curve, or you fail it out quickly. Same story, new channel, right? Healthcare. Another double-digit percentage of your GDP and massive flux. Once again, Internet of Things for the remote monitoring of chronic care conditions is expected to have an impact of $1.1 trillion per year by 2025. Once again, we see shared objectives. The wearable tech people with the smart home people are on the same page with the healthcare drivers for things like quality of care, cost of care, as well as uh, personalized medicine. And what are the wonderful things that are just uh, coming down the road? We see exoskeletons where everybody's gonna be able to get up and walk again. We see nanobots in the blood. We see incitables in your eyes and in your ears. We see 3D printed organic replaceable parts. We see stem cell reconstructive and plastic surgery. It's fantastic stuff. And what are the disruptions we see? Healthcare is not very customer focused. It, it starts as soon as you lose trust with having to fill in the same information across multiple forms every time. Where else do you tolerate that? And the smart home build outs for aging in place is not being built in the home. We see the first build outs in the, in the premium high end assisted living facilities at a very high cost sold to the children. And guess what? The wealthy get access to the healthcare breakthroughs first. So their health, their, their lifespans expand more quickly, and at the bottom end, it slows. And what's knocking on your door, what's crossed the chasm, what's right, right on the cusp here, we see in-home lab testing and mind control prosthetics and augmented reality robotic surgery systems, as well as low-cost. DNA by mail. And what is their mitigation strategy? How are they trying to bring this technology forward? How are they trying to mitigate the disruptions? How are they trying to bring the social changes along with? It's exactly the same as in transportation. Pilots, multidisciplinary teams, do the simple things first. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Social co-creation, bring the regulatory structures and frameworks up from within the pilot so that the standards are, are stress test and informed in the pilot itself, and then promote. P 
promote the positive use cases or fail out quickly. It's simple, it's fast, it's effective, and it's intuitive. So, we see innovations accelerating pace. We see huge uh, industry scale disruptions are all around us. We see the social fabric being stressed and pushing back and stalling, and in some cases, in some cases pushing back on critical changes, sometimes surfacing unintended consequences. But we also see that some very simple and practical processes can help work out the kinks in how advances advance. It's simple pilots that are structured, that are local and small scale, where both the experts and the end consumers work together to solve the problems to both the technical and the social solutions by sharing objectives. So I assert that these small, simple, shared steps can and will smooth out that bumpy rocket ride of progress. Thank you very much.